What's up? What's up? My God, what's going on? How you doing? I'm all right. Funny, this technology thing. It's good. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I think I can. I know, I got these. Yeah, just let me know. I, I can hear you fine. Okay, I think I can hear you better now. So how are we doing yeah. today? Just getting up. Surprise. Yeah, just trying to get going. Usual Monday morning. Monday morning it is. So tell us who you are and what you do and where you're located. All right, my name is David Weeks. I make my primary lighting, but we also do furniture, toys, all kinds of stuff, whatever piques our interest. Okay. And, um, I'm currently residing in Germantown, New York, due to the COVID that's phenomenon. That's way upstate. I like that. Yeah, it's not too bad. About two hours out of the city. So and, um, is, is, is that your, your, your quarantine place? It's my quarantine. Yeah, exactly. Or, or is, is, is that where your shop is? It's... Um, No, no, it's, well, that's, well, we've been here for a long time now. It's like we got up here in March, so we've been yeah, okay. settled in. We'll, we'll get into that because I, I looked at buying a place in Germantown. Oh, yeah? It was yeah. A, a dairy farm, and there was a little pond on the property, and a barn on the, on the, on the, uh, on the, on the road. Oh, oh, yeah, that sounds very familiar. Yeah, that was about 15, 16 years ago. It could be the same place. We've only bought it about four or five years ago. Yeah. All right, so we're going to get into a series of questions before we get started, and then we'll get into your journey and your wonderful lighting and furniture. All right. What word or phrase do you overuse? I don't... No. As I say, I don't talk enough to make a say anything overused, but... Um, um, what is your least favorite thing to do? Least favorite? Um, yeah, get bored. I mean, it's like running out of things to do or running out of places to go. Okay. What is your most favorite thing to do? I like to be making, for sure. Very satisfied, whether it's with the family or just be in, in my own head. Okay. What is the one thing your spouse would like to change about you? Obsessive compulsive behavior. All right. What makes you tick? Just curiosity. I think stuff, whatever's next, whatever I haven't figured out. All right. What hurts you the most? Okay, what what's me the most? What irks you the most? Politics. Right. Bad politics. <laughs> yeah, bad, bad. All bad. <laughs> yeah. Um if you were have if you were to travel cross country on a motorcycle, who would it be with? I think I'd see if Dennis Hopper would want to re live his role of from from um Easy Rider. Get the football helmets on and travel back across the country. <laughs> no, no, I need a real person. A real person? Dennis yeah, a real person. <laughs> this He's is alive, isn't it? It's got to be a real person. Um, who would that be? <laughs> really? The hardest question you've given me so far. Um, Henry Winkler? Henry Winkler? A real person, man. Someone you know, not a, a, a celebrity. Oh, a real person? I'm close. He and I are very tight. Say it again? No, no. He and I are very tight. Oh, you and Henry Winkler are tight. <laughs> that... <clears throat> How about John Edelman? I'm sorry? John Edelman. How about that? Okay. He's... And he's a buddy of yours? Yeah. Okay. He's a... All right, so if you were to go to a card game and a fight could possibly break out, who would you take? 
get Shaquille. Who? Shaquille O'Neal. No, man, this is about your life. These are real. You know Shaquille O'Neal? I don't know Shaquille. Okay. All right. This is this is this is for us to get right. to know you, right? So right. Help me by giving me real answers about you. Okay. All right. That's what this is about. This is about your journey. So when we talk about the journey, I don't want to hear about Michael Jordan's journey. I want to hear about yours. All right. All right. Fair enough. All right. So what Can sound bothers back? you the most? Sound? Yes, yeah, sound. Um, I think that table saw as much as that. Okay. What profession other than your own would you like to try? Try animation. So do you draw? Yeah. Okay. So if you were to do animation, what to what 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 direction would you want to go in? Just abstract, like sort of um stop motion and um okay. just general. All right. Yeah. What would you like on your tombstone? Did the best he could with what he had. All right, cool. All right, so now we'll get into the journey. All right. The journey is from high school, the different things in your life that led and pointed to what you do now, the different jobs, the different experiences, the different people. Right. Um, I always wanted to be an artist since I was real young. My parents were always really supportive of that. So I actually had the opportunity to believe in that and have aspirations in that direction and not have someone saying you can't do that or you can't go there. Okay, um, so let, let, me, let me ask you, in high school, were you doing art or were you in the sports? Um, I did a little, I was just a straight up high school. So I did art, but uh, my teacher was like, oh, you're good, you can do whatever you want. So no one bothered t teaching anything. It's just sort of like, whatever. <laughs> Okay, so where, where, where'd you go to high school? At uh, Clark Central High School in Athens, Georgia. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So after high school, then what? Then I got into uh, school design. Okay. Went straight there. And, um, yeah, just that, that totally opened up everything, sort of blew my mind. Because again, I coming from Georgia with very little arts education. And going up there with like Listen, full blown. I went, I went to college in Georgia. There's very little oh, yeah? education. <laughs> yeah, they kind of keep the lean on that. Yeah, yeah. Where in Georgia? I went to Morehouse. Oh, okay, that's great. Okay. So, okay, yeah. so let me let me ask you. Um, it's probably obvious. So you went to Rhode Island instead of going to SCAD. Yeah, SCAD was just getting started at that time, and it wasn't really. Yeah, I think it was just in its early phases. Okay. And RISD was so predominant, so beautiful. Yep. It's a great place to be. All right. So, so you get there and then what? I went to RISD again. Like that, that is this great opportunity where your freshman year, you do all these, um, you know, basic courses. Like you draw for six hours a day, you sculpt for six hours a day, you do patterns for six hours a day, and it just felt like. Oh, like an actual job, but doing the things you want to do instead of like all the crap that you've done prior to that. So it was a great, it was just really like, I think it just to have all those people, because again, coming from the South, there's not a lot of, you know, eccentric. I mean, you got your eccentricities, but they're kind of more specific to the region. And um, at RISD, it's like, sort of they let all the kids out of all the weird classes in high schools and put them all in one place. So, Everybody got good. out of jail. Yeah, exactly. And they were like, you're here too? I thought that was the only one. <laughs> so that must have been good. Yeah, that was great. That was phenomenal. So th that allowed you to be comfortable and be whoever you are, and that helped with your creativity. Yeah. Again, it was just sort of like, like you knew how to do stuff, but you didn't, I don't know. I mean, you hadn't really blown the top off yet. You were still drawing like, oh, let me see if I can do a good drawing of a portrait or something. I can shade so, it right. So what did you study? What did you end up studying? I, ended up studying um, I started in sculpture and I ended up in painting. 
Okay. So what what kind of sculpture did you start with? It was um Am I too loud? No, no, my headphones hurt. I don't know where they hurt me. But um oh first sculpture they were like um Don Litsky or Vito Conti or Donald Bachelor or um I don't know, it was more like those contemporary artists of the 80s that were sort of like off the, the main, the main you, thing. What years were you there? From um, 86 to 90. Okay, all right. Because Peter Harrison's in here, he just came on. He, he, was, he was there also, but I don't know when. Oh yeah, Alan Wexler, you should get him on the show too. Who? Alan Wexler. Alan Wexler. Yeah, he's great. He's a risky I'll grad. Check him, I'll check him out. Yeah, it's very cool. Like right. sort of break down kitchens and stuff like that. Okay, cool. All right, so you, you're there, you start painting, you graduate and then what? And I went straight to New York. Because it was like all kind of focused on New York at that point anyway. So yeah, we used to like sneak on the buses for field trips to New York every weekend. I'd come down and like, you know, just make the best of it. Uh, Peter Harrison went to RIT. I apologize. Uh. <laughs> um, so, so you hop on a bus, you head to New York. Did you have a job? I um, I followed my girlfriend at the time, now wife, and um. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. So I had free rent. No, no, I was paying my rent. <laughs> but um, um. <laughs> Yeah, no, we just came down and, um, yeah, New York was great. It was that thing where it's like you could show any sort of portfolio you wanted and people would give you the, you know, sort of appreciate it. Like I remember I showed my painting portfolio to crate makers and to, you know, carpenters and set builders and they were like, well, yeah, you seem pretty capable. So it's kind of great that those like, it wasn't like, yeah, you've never done carpentry work, so what are you doing in here? So everyone was really, it's a cool city for that, you know. I don't know if it's still that way, but it was really so open to anybody with, you know, drive or energy or interest. So you went, you went from um, Rhode Island School of Design to following your girlfriend to New York to showing your portfolio to carpenters and just getting a carpenter job. So would you walk up to people who were doing a, on a building site? No, it's more like Marissi has a good connection. I think I talked to one friend who sent me to this one guy who did set building, and he gave me a list of like 10 people to call. And it was just really random. I'd walk in there and be like, I'm here to show my portfolio with no real connection. But um, yeah, but it, it worked out, you know. This one guy, Jim Schmidt, who made big sculptures for Ashley Bakerton and all these major artists at the time, hired me to sand aluminum, you know, and like just do it, but the down and dirty stuff. But, um, so, so how long did you sand aluminum? About a year, maybe two. And I worked for this one guy who made mannequins for a while. And, yeah, and I worked at a Decker painter's place, which was really an awful, it wasn't an awful job. I was just really awful at it. So that was not a good job. Yeah, there's a difference. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you're making mannequins and... Okay, did, did, when you were sending the aluminum, was it for public spaces or was it for, for private commercial? No, it's like the very high end. Like it was weird because like Ashley Bickerton, is just, he'd be surfing in Bali and he just hired Jim Schmidt to make this like kind of complicated, sloganized, I don't know, like water. Like he kind of create these technical looking objects and then they'd be sold for but they were total high-end art, um, art for Soho at the time, like Mary Boone and stuff like that. So he was, um, but he'd always come in from Bali and check out and see how the work was going. And I'd be sitting there with my desk mask and everything on, just like trying to get the lines just right in the aluminum tubing that we had red pad. But, but th there, was a, there, was a, there was a purpose for all of that. There was, there was a real reason. It was, and it definitely was very eye-opening. And another great New York thing where you sort of, that taste of something you never thought you'd, you'd see the inside of. Right. Okay, so, and then you go into mannequins, and how long did you make mannequins? 
That was a good job. That was actually nice. It was in this one guy's shop and a wood stove. And I'd like go in there in the morning, crank up the wood stove. And then I'd weld, there were seal mannequins. So they're basically a hanger with a head and I, okay, a sort of creative version of a mannequin. And then that, I remember one day the city came and checked to make sure I wasn't on fire because there was so much smoke coming out of the, the wood stove. But um, that, that means you didn't know how to burn the wood. You got to get it hot. I know, exactly. Yeah, I was early novice, my wood burning face. <laughs> so, did you all make mannequins from scratch? Yeah, it was just like three inch tubing, and he sort of, it was really, it was actually really great because it's like he had such a simple, he had like one um, handheld bandsaw, grinder, a gas oxyacetylene tank, and a vise, and you just sort of figure out however you could bend it. And then eventually he just like, you know, let me do it on my own. And it became very cool. I'd like come up there early in the morning, get the wood stuff going and just been metal all day. And then he come in at the end of the day and check out, make sure everything's okay. So, so the mannequins were metal? Yeah, they were steel, yeah. They're getting like a hanger. Like if you made a hanger out of three inch solid metal and then built a whole body for it. Wow. So yeah, it was cool. And how long did you make mannequins? Probably two years or so. And then after mannequins, then, then what we do? I guess um, at that point I was sort of, it was all part-time work. So I had given up on the decorative painting. But before I did, they, our last painting job was with Ted Mewling studio. He's a jeweler, a phenomenal jeweler. But um, I was totally lucked into. I could okay, just one, okay one, one second, David. What, what, with the mannequin job and the salmon job, were, were these decent paying jobs or they weren't? They were okay. I mean, I was out of school in 1986, New York City. You know, were living with three or four people in a, in a loft in, on Canal Street. And um, yeah, as long as you could get your, your beer intake and everyone else, you know, it's like, you didn't really think that much about it. I don't remember what I got paid, frankly. Maybe 10, maybe 12, I don't know. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, uh, then I, stum I just stumbled into this other job from the painting company. And this guy was opening a store on Green Street in Soho. His name's Ted Mewling. And I just, like, once I got in there, I was like, oh, this is where I want to work. Because he just was so creative and had all these great little prototypes and projects everywhere. So at that point, I started, like, just working, doing any odd jobs that he had. And eventually, he offered me a full time job. And, um, that's really the start of what I do today was that experience. Okay, so when you were, when you were painting, what, was it abstracts or was it something specific? Oh, this company painting? Or when yeah. I painted? Like my personal painting? Yes. Yeah, no, it was um, sort of a mix. Like there was a lot of mixed media stuff. I would do stuff with sound and very contemporary art sort of stuff. Um, mechanisms, I had like speakers and like I created a steel walking machine and made a pen for it so it would like sort of roam around in the gallery and I had it mic so it had this like very like <laughs> like kind of crazy noise so it would, so it would move around the studio. And you, and you um, made that? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That was good. So yeah, no, was... Were, were, were you part of the, the urban art scene? I.e. graffiti? No, I can't, not as a graffiti. I was definitely in, I did some work with Kid Robot and stuff, and I was, I've always been, loved that kind of pop culture. That sort of creative, as a collective sort of component of, of you know, the creative scene in the 90s. He says, oops, said, Ted Mewling, how are you full time? What's that? Oh. Oh, he hired initially. Well, he hired me to make his to fabricate the, the jewelry. So, yeah, like it was um, it was a bench job. There was three or four of us in there, and we would um clean up the castings and assemble the pieces and raise the little connections together. They're always great because it'd be like a a bracelet that had thirty different parts, and you had to kind of assemble all the parts and get them all organized clean them all up and then it's really really satisfying 
<laughs> All right. So you, you're working in the painting place where you're happy. And what kind of no. painting? I'm sorry? The, no, I thought you were saying the painting place was a decorative painting. I was not happy no. there. You were not? I it's a decorative painting. No, no, the guy I was painting his studio, he was a jeweler. And I was... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, once you answered that question, I, I, I went to the last thing you were talking about. Okay. Is that you were working, you got a job painting, and you were happy that that's what you wanted to do. Right, well, no, but it was more, I was painting for the jeweler store, and then I switched over from painting for just general maintenance. Okay. And I started building, for, building jewelry for him. You got upgraded. You got to raise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how, how long were you there? I was there for like five, six years. I'm not sure. Okay. But, um, so and, and after that, what'd you do? Well, during that time, I sort of like, I got a little studio with a friend in Dumbo and we um, started collecting equipment. Um, there was a steel shop out in Weehawken that I used to be able to rent time in. And I kind of built a little this fabrication studio for myself. Um, so I made like clothes racks and curtain rods, cast things and metal briefcases and all this art in general. So I was kind of like playing all the feet, all the bases within that, that category. Um, and then eventually, eventually I left Ted, but it was definitely hard. I, I quit once and came back and then quit a second time. So, um, and then at that point, I sort of decided I was just going to do lighting. I think I made a couple of prototypes at that time. Go ahead. There was a couple of prototypes I had built at that time, um, sort of based on stuff I could find at the flea market. I kind of like a collect parts and pieces from different places. And then um, then use the jewelry. Wait, so, so, so you, were, you were piecing lighting together before you were making originals? No, it was no. I was taking originals, tearing them apart, and remaking new versions. So, like, kind of using the hardware from old lamps. Yep. Yeah, that's well, what I meant. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, yeah. So at that time, I finally was like, "All right, I'm going to go for this." And I um, I left Ted's, and I had like, I decided I was going to make ten lamps. I made ten desk lamps, and just out of whatever, there was wood veneer, there was fiberglass, there was aluminum, steel, um, like fiberglass with burlap in it. I sort of was trying all different stuff. And I got a, a booth at the ICFS, New York City Furniture Fair. And I got the, the really prestigious booth right by the bathrooms. So. Listen, don't hate. That's a good spot because everyone's got to go there. That's true. Absolutely. I heard that a lot. Everyone was like, oh, good. I wouldn't have seen this if I didn't have to go there. <laughs> yeah. They may not see you on the way in, but better possibility to catch you on That's the way true. out. Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. A little more relaxed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, you do your first show. How'd that work out? It was good. It's, again, another New York scenario where it's like you just kind of put stuff on a shelf and, and people can see, you know, ability and talent and vision and stuff. So a lot of people came and were like, oh, these are great. And like, I got some great commissions immediately. Like one of those commissions that you always fantasize, like in there's some guy's redoing his Tribeca loft. And he says, why don't you just do all the lighting? Like, what? That's insane. Look, and, and that guy usually doesn't have a budget. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, totally. And then I remember I got my check for that project. I don't remember what it was. It was like $3,000 or something. I was like, oh, my God, I could quit now. Like, you know, totally satisfied. <laughs> Ready to retire, right? <laughs> yeah, check that list. I'm fucking with this. But, um, but, yeah, it was great. And so we went back and made some of the pieces that we made for that studio are, are still in the collection. Wow. So how long did you return to that show? I went back probably seven times. Well, a couple of times with different names and trying to change it up a little bit. What was your first name? Well, it started out as David Studio, but then we did Butter, a friend of mine and I. Um, we created a different, like, sort of more low-key. Not low-key, but, like, you know, my stuff was so elaborate and really complicated and hard to build. 
So I tried to make like the simplest lighting. In fact, the adage was that there was no electricity allowed. So everything had to clip onto an existing bulb. So you had like the socket, the cord, and the, and the plug, and whatever you can add to that is what the product would be. Okay. So yeah, it was good. It was a good, successful company. All right. So when you started, it was you and another gentleman in the studio? Um, Carl Martinez, he was just a, a good friend. He and I shared the studio together. And, um, okay. He did you know, mostly mirrors and furniture, and I was doing lighting. All right. So you do shows for seven years, and did your studio ever change at that time? Change? What do you mean? Like, I mean, did you get into, have to get into a bigger place? Did you outgrow? Oh, you know, that's the crazy I was out, I was growing, but it just laterally. I was sort of taking over other studios that I can, I shared walls with. So like when somebody would move out, I would go down to landlord and sort of see if I could take that place too. So eventually I sort of expanded into four different studios. I you know, one okay. listening to you say that, Mark Jupiter, who just came on, did the exact same thing. Oh yeah. He grew in place. Yeah, it's good. And I, even in hindsight, I was like, that was a good setup. Like, you know, leaving there was good. We got a lot of, like, a, a lot of additional qualities to the studio. But there's something really nice about the fact that you kind of, like, expanded naturally. Um, there's this one, one sort of epic wall with this huge brick wall that sort of, I don't know, has 14 inches thick. And I asked my landlord, I was like, hey, do you want to cut a hole in that wall? And my, he was crazy enough to say, yeah, sure, I'll take care of that for you. So this guy came in with a, and like one guy with a hammer drill. They put up I-beam in the ceiling and they just like blew out the entire wall. And I was like, so, it must have compromised this building. There's no way that's like, that's like a healthy <laughs> I idea. I need to move. <laughs> exactly. I'll be here for a little while, but I'm not going to see it for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so how much longer did you stay there? I stayed there still probably five more years, I think. Okay. Um, so at what point did you realize that you've made a name for yourself and things are going well? It was about that time because I had left. I mean, before that, I had sort of like a mixed group of stores that I was selling to in around the city. But there wasn't a lot of, like, there's a lot of effort just to, like, get things to the store and shipping and all the sort of headaches. So at that point, a friend of mine, Chris Larica, I don't know if you talked to him, he's great, I'm a woodworker. But he, um, he started working with Ralph Pucci International, the gallery on 23rd Street. Okay. Um, 18th. And, uh, and so I joined, Ralph was great. I sort of, I spent a long time trying to get him interested. And then he um, finally, Trigger. So then I had a full blown gallery to support me, um, which was great. He was a great guy, really good to like grow the business with. Okay, so let, let me let me pause you right there. I, I, I have a couple of questions about about the growth. During this time, where you where you're trying to get this guy to notice you, where where were you at? Where were you at financially with the struggle and the survival of the business? Were you, were you doing okay financially and you wanted to get him to put you on another level or you needed, needed him to get you to, so you can make more money to get to the, the next level? Um, no, no, I think I was making okay money, but it was just complicated, you know, for one wholesale versus retail, you know, and then I think, I think for one, he really sort of allowed the prices to go up when I started selling with him. Like when I was on my own selling, you know, when you'd ask for three thousand dollars for a standing lamp, people would be like, "Oh, no, they'd be dubious." But then once, I mean, I started to establish that outside of his studio. But once we were in there, it was very easy to be like, "Oh, now it's ten thousand dollars." So he's really, he was, he's crucial. I mean, to the whole manufacturing, like to sort of the growth of the financial end of the business. He's one of those rare people. Yeah, there's some New York, like it's a lot of New York places, like Tiffany's and Burdorf's and whatever else, where people don't ask prices. They just tell them to wrap it up. Right. 
it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. So, yeah, that was a good thing. And that's still, yeah, I still totally appreciate all that. And I was there for over 10 years. We did a lot of great stuff. Good stuff, LA shows, and he expanded during that time. And then at some point, I guess I was looking into another studio space. And um, we did the math officially for the company, which was be like what we could afford. And once we actually had the retail numbers instead of the wholesale numbers. And once we did the math, we're like, I think we can do it on our own. So, and you know, someone made it very simple and said, do you want to uh, work just as hard for twice as much money? Or do you want to work half as hard for the same amount of money? So, and it was really true. It was like that made, Wholesale, real, retail, really, really clear. But um, yeah, if I want to manage it on my own, I can keep all of it. I can total vertical company. So um, but yeah, so that was in a, that that period was the, was that next step. So and that, and that made you concentrate more on retail. It made me. I actually opened a store in Tribeca at that point, and um, yeah, and again, just sort of. Yeah, and just sort of kind of created a whole new system, which is, I mean, the fun part was when I had that other company, Butter, which was the sort of simple add-ons to existing light bulbs. We did a lot of fun shows and vending machines and all these other kinds of stuff that sort of played into my, the art world that I had been involved with. So, and Fuji was great, but it also had a very, very highbrow, you know, it was like there was no, sense of humor there. There wasn't you know, sort of playfulness, which I think I had started making the toys like a few years prior to that. You make making so toys? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, we had a whole line of, you know, the Q-Bot? Yes. Little wooden, yeah, we made, I made that. Wow. So that, came, that came from my studio. So, um, yeah, so we were doing that at the time and it was sort of felt really good. Um, and it was, yeah, it was more, it just was more fun. It kind of took me back to like where I started at Art Tool. And uh, so that was the hope for opening a store in Tribeca, was to be able to sort of dictate the storyline and have this, the opportunity to sort of really create the narrative that, that went along with the work. So how, how long were you, how long is your, do you still have a store in Tribeca? Yeah, I still do. And where's it located? It's on Walker, 38 Walker, near church. Okay, and how long have you been there? It's been like eight years now. Okay, and, and what is, how has the current situation affected you? It's pretty crazy. It's like, my landlord's really, you know, a rare story. She's incredibly supportive. And, you know, when I'm in, like in this sort of situation that we're in right now, she's been really understanding. And, um, yeah, we just were working it out month by one. But yeah, it's hard to know what the future holds. Yeah, I, um, I said it here before, same situation for me. I, I have a relationship with my shop landlord and my yard landlord. Right. And when I was behind two months each, yeah, they were like, okay, you don't have to explain to them that. I said, listen, I'm not hurting. I just, I'm waiting on this job to clear and, and I'll right. be able to take care of it. And they, and they were fine. Yeah, exactly. No, we, we, we're all cleaned up. We're not behind on any rent or anything. But it's just, um, it's just hard to know, like, moving forward, how, like, it's just, yeah, no one knows what's going on. Like. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah things, are, things are quite unstable now. You don't know yeah. what direction it's going in. I, I for even, some reason, think that people are going to push very hard to get back to the way things work. I mean, yeah, no, they're I think, doing it I mean, now, and a lot of people are getting sick. They just don't care. They just want to get back to. Oh, it's true. What we call normal. Yeah, capitalism must survive. Yes. You know, it's just it's extreme. It's like, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, and it's, it's funny. I don't know if it's just New York. I guess Florida and all the other kind of state kind of states that are having real ambitious, you know, sort of over. They should be taking a pause, but they're not, kind of thing. <laughs> it's just getting like. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen with that, but New York is one of those places that has its own engine. You know, it can sort of like just turn on that sort of extra gear that you didn't know it had and create a 
new market or new new story yeah, yeah because of because of the energy and the people and, and you're right so so many of those places you know they thought we were crazy yeah uh, by slowing things down the way we did and we have you know twice as many people as those and they went yeah. out full blast and now they have to backtrack right exactly so we're yeah. probably another month or two behind oh exactly and like we had i mean you gotta love new york also for its professionalism you know cuomo that whole time that he was doing his speaks talks every night he was just like so methodical and so like he just trusted what he was doing and it wasn't like let's just take a chance on this and like kind of you know open up the bars again or something and he was totally committed and i think new yorkers also took it seriously and, you know yes yeah and, and i think also because they I, I think what we did the other places aren't doing when people were dying when people when they had freezes outside with body ends they showed the graphicness and we were able yeah. to see firsthand people who died they were on the news and then through social media people who knew those people were like oh i knew this guy we worked together for two right, years right. and now he's gone so yeah, it, was no. very, it made it tangible in these other places they're not they're not covering it that way yeah i think it's a good point like it's sort of yeah to make the case clear like you know make it really you know again because yeah it's a big deal i mean no one wants to be sitting at home yeah but, like, I mean, the fact that know, like some some people do like appreciate the requirements and sort of stick with it. Yeah, know that it'll, it will have time. Right, and even those people who get sick and and recover, it still affects right. your body. Yeah, totally. So, so no one's getting away free. No, exactly. Yeah, there, there's just there are different levels of of severity that that you come away with. Yeah, I mean, even and the irresponsibility of the politics and everything, and it's sort of like. A lot of the people who are just like, well, whatever, we're going to lose a few people on this one. As long as, you know, we get TJ Maxx back open, it's going to be okay. You know? <laughs> and Applebee's. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I really don't get that. And we, and we as a country, as, as, as much as I love this country and as wonderful as the people are, we're selfish. Oh, my God. I mean, you, you, mm -hmm. make, you make something inconvenient for us, and we think that we're oppressed. No, it's totally. I mean, it's, it's, if, if you imagine, right, when you sit at the red light, and before the light turns green, the guy behind you is honking. Yeah, no, it's that's so maddening. Like just take a breath. It's like, yeah, we what can only go on the next light. Yeah, it's like I gotta get my coffee. It's like you know whatever whatever's important to him. It's like if he told you, you'd be like, no, I'm not gonna spoil it. Twenty times. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's and it's important to him, and, and you're not, or nothing else is. Right. Exactly. And, and and I can be guilty of of that impatient thing as well. And and I'm I'm trying to be more conscious of that. Is that where am I rushing to? Yeah, no, exactly. I think also just life in general. As you get older, I mean, even this COVID moment, it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, hard to work around. But at the same time, I've had like a really unusual four months that I would never have had any other way. Just to sort of step out of like your your usual day, and so the grind that you kind of put yourself through, especially in New York, where it's like I gotta keep working. I just have to keep working. And then to like have come up here to Germantown and like to chill out and to work. Yeah, I and mean, we're working and everything. We're doing the Zoom calls. We're doing everything we need to do. But just like taking it down a couple of notches has been like. Yeah. It, and, and I think, you know, as you said, I think we all, especially in this city and other major cities, need to slow down for just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, just to be rational. I mean, just to like sort of be with your kids and do whatever you got to do and just sort of. Yeah, and, and, and literally to be rational. Yeah, no, totally, because I am irrational in the city. You know, when yes. it's time for yeah. where you're like, I've got to get this done. I'm going to work all day Saturday and Sunday. I'm going to try to finish this thing. Like, and then whatever happens, you don't really, it's not due until the next two weeks later or whatever. <laughs> you know, you always make it like, yeah, just like. <laughs> We're always borrowing trouble. Yeah, exactly. Making it worse than it is. <laughs> right. So how, how with, with your shop, and you being there, how many people do, do you, your shop, your store, do you work there as well? Or you work somewhere um, else and you have a store? Yeah, we have a, our factory is out in bed -Stuy Okay. on Atlantic Avenue in Utica. All right. And we bought that about five years ago. So that's been, I mean, it's been a, it's 
yeah, it's been hard, but it's been good. And that's and that's where we left Dumbo to move there. And um, and again, we put, gave it all the bells and whistles that we didn't have, and a sort of makeshift version in Dumbo. But um, yeah, so that I worked like half the week there and half the week in, in the city. Yeah. Okay. So you purchased a place in bed -Stuy. Yeah. Okay. And how big is, and that's your studio where you, where you do all your manufacturing? Yeah, exactly. And how big is that? It's, um, well, it's two buildings. One building we do rent it out just for the long term. And then I guess the other one's like 4,000 square feet. Jesus. How, you've been there for five years? Uh, yeah, almost. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the thing we were saying about New York where it's like, I didn't need that big a problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a great problem to have. You know, it's like nice to own real estate. But I mean, all those, all those, like the nooks and crannies and the details and the roofing and, the, and all the other stuff that goes along with it. You, you went from a lighting manufacturer to a general contractor. Yeah, plus like a landlord, plus a, you know, yeah, maintenance person, plus you've got to deal with the city of bureaucracy. Fire department's coming by looking at stuff. Yeah. yeah. When, when um, uh, you're, you're absolutely right because you, you start one thing and it turns completely into another with you trying to grow. Yeah. And yeah exactly. Become... That's, sorry, a, that's, a, that's a New York kind of capitalistic American thing where it's like, you've got to be growing. You know, there's that ad, it's like, you know, if you stop growing, it's over. I don't think that's true. I think, you know, if you can sort of manage your company to be what it needs to be, you know, maybe you don't need 40 people making, what? Maybe you get away with 10 or like eight. Or, you know, if you do the math right and say like, I want to take home this much money, that means, and I want to have like three employees or 10 employees, whatever it is, and then you do the math and work backwards. So I think we're always so like geared to be like, do the next more. thing. More, 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 more. What about LA? How was that in LA? Yeah. You know, it's like it's pushing harder and harder. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Because I I started this building a house upstate. This is a second home. Right. Um, and this is when I was looking in. I was looking in Germantown. I was up. The, right. I was all up the Hudson. Right. Right. And I worked at Four Seasons Hotel. Okay. Um, I worked in a bar, so I worked Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday and Friday. I came right. in at 5 p.m. So um, I, I was had the mornings off and the Saturday, Sunday, Monday, uh, Saturday night, I would drive upstate. Sometimes I sleep in my van. Yeah. Um, I get up, I drive 100 miles, I get up, and then I drive another 100. Oh, like antique. when you're looking for space? Well, I was looking for space. I was looking for antiques. I was looking for um, <clears throat> barn wood. Right. And, and, the, and the reason why I always drove after my one o'clock shift was because I'd be halfway there. Right. So I wake up and only have to drive two hours ago as opposed to waking up and having to drive four. Right, right. Plus, I didn't have AC in the van and at night it was cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So okay. yeah, I, I, I made it work. Right, right. Totally. So I'm looking around, searching around, and I find this place in Liberty. Um, which is a whole nother story. Yeah. So I, 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 I get a place and I want to put this kind of wood in it. So I had to start making it. So I went from building a house to getting lumber, to getting a saw, to cutting right. wood. And here we are. Yeah. See, and you probably <laughs> could like, could have partnered with somebody. You probably could like found a like outlet for that. You probably could like, but I totally, I totally appreciate that. I mean, I think, yeah, it's that, you know, that need to make things. And as you learn more, you want to be involved from the beginning instead of like at the end. You yeah, get, now, get two by four at the lumber store, you're like, that's not interesting. Right. You make your own two by four, that's totally. Yeah, because like now, I, you know, I have two sawmills, I have a kiln, I have over a million board feet of lumber, and I have crazy overhead. Yeah. So, so my thing is, I need to get back up state. Right. On 20 acres, cut my overhead in half where I can sleep at night. Right. 
Yeah. And, and to your point, it's like, you know, this is the problem I didn't need. Because with that becomes, you know, I have four forklifts. I got to keep those running. Got to keep right. the machines running. Um, two generators. It, it, they're, they're just, yeah. it, it goes on and on and on. And now when, when I see guys doing this and everybody wants to get a sawmill and make right. furniture, I'm like, you need to decide what part of that you want to do. Yeah, that's exactly it. I because, think it's so true. Yeah, because I, I think talking to, to um, watching Martin Goble and even um, with Mark Jupiter, when you get a relationship with a guy who's manufacturing lumber, that right. saves you so much time. Yeah, and they get it so much effort. Yeah, like storage, just like you're saying, like, Stacking wood, does that one pile get wet? So now that's not like usable anymore. You know, it, like, it just it, it never stops. It never yeah. ever stops. And it's, yeah. it's it's just a lot, you know. And every guy that makes furniture doesn't need a sawmill. No, that's definitely you true. You just need an outlet to get the wood at the right price. It's also that thing where it's like a curse, where like you get distracted and you think like, if I get at the wood, then I'd be a good furniture maker. So it's like you got to be good from the start. You know, you got to be like have good ideas to buy, to use the wood for and stuff. Yep, and, and everything else builds itself organically and naturally, exactly. as you know. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a trick right there, sort of finding your voice and, you know, your level of commitment and interest and trying to, like, hone that down to the exact, you know, best So what, what's next for you? Um, I think this house up here, the building we have up here upstate, it's, um, it's this old foundry building. And I'm trying to figure out a way, again, based on the last few months, how I can like be up here three days a week and have like a wood shop up here and then have our metal shop in bed and then um, figure out the retail. So, and, uh, so you got that country life and you like it, right? I like it. It's good. I grew up I mean, from Georgia. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm from Louisiana. Oh, yeah? So oh. There, 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 there's, a, there's a lot to be said about slowing it down. Oh, totally. And a lot about, yeah, just like this. Yeah, it's just not thinking too hard. <laughs> it's probably not a, probably a bad sign. But there's yeah. something about, like, you know, just, um, like, appreciating, yeah, the afternoons or something. Like, you know? And also, I mean, I'm just as crazy here as I am in the city. Like, I've got all these, like, new construction projects that I'm trying to do, along with making more lighting and more furniture. And you're just, like, killing yourself day in and day out when you're like, oh, why am I, you know, everywhere I go, I seem to have the same problem. And then, and then you look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, Get snap out of it. That or you're just like covered with mud. You're like, what? What? <laughs> um, there's a recent comment here. Um, FY Mexico, David, it's Margaret Hefner here. Nice to see and hear you. Oh, it's great. Margaret. Great. Funny, we've never done this before. So you do this all the time? Yeah, I do it three days a week. 10, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Cool. And yeah. it's with all sorts of people. I, I started out doing woodworking and I figured, because I, I follow everybody. Tattoo yeah. artists, you name it. I, 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 I'm interested in a lot of different things, so I follow these people. And I'm right. thinking, I'm looking at a different type of artist and I'm thinking wow I bet that person has a cool story as well yeah so that's oh, I think I got into all, all of it so we'll be interviewing we have a 6 p.m. on Wednesday we have a baker from California um, we have a, a guy that makes draperies on Friday that's in uh, Canada so it's all no I think it's great and I think it's great that like you're interviewing them so it's like your point of view and your questions and which would be very different from my point of view, my questions, and you know. Now, just, let me let me tell you the let me tell you the other thing that I want to do that we're we're starting to do. Um, we did it once with with uh, Jack English and uh, and Taylor Dunsker, but what I want to do is start having other people come on, and communicate with people that they know. Right. Because it's a completely different dynamic than me doing it. Yeah. Like the, the, the people you mentioned are people you know. So you talking to them about business and experiences is probably a lot more in depth than me asking general questions because 
you all have experiences in a relationship. No, it's true. I mean, we've all got our own sort of strengths and our, and our, our knowledge base. Yeah, I, I agree. I always wanted to do. Did you ever see that movie um, by Jim Jarmusch, Coffee and Cigarettes? No. And he gets like Iggy Pop and Tom Waits to have lunch together. And then he has, I can't remember the other people in the movie, but it's kind of thing of like, I would watch that every week. It's like if you could have like two good people having lunch together. Sort of like dinner with Andre kind of moment where it's like you sort of hear like two really smart people's point of view on anything, everything that they're thinking about. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So my question to you is, who would you want to have a conversation with? I would like Tom Waits would be pretty great. But I know, I know. I got, but you go back to, uh, I don't know, there's so many people to be really great to talk to. You know, designers, but I mean, musicians and like job. Have you watched that, um, that Rick Rubin, Shangri-La documentary? Yeah. In fact, I, I totally love talking to him. LL Cool J was on it in that same thing, and he was like totally... Yeah, they, they kind of interesting. Yeah, they're talking yeah, they together. Kinda, they kind of built it together. Yeah, totally. And that was like, and even to see them at that point in their lives, and they sort of taken everything they've collected and sort of, and just to sit back and talk about the old days or whatever else, it's like pretty great to see that huge circle of life. Or, yeah, you know, these people L, jump on different L, L started when he was 16, 17. Yeah. No, crazy. that's amazing. Crazy. I'm crazy. I know. I there's like. Um, and I'm probably close to the same age as, age as him. I was in New Orleans, and I'm walking down Canal Street. Right, and I have to be 14 or 15. Maybe he's a little older. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe he was younger. I don't know. I remember walking down the street, right, and seeing this guy on the other side of the street, Canal Street, walk down the street, right? He had on a red hat, he had on yeah. no shirt, and he had on red, red uh, Adidas jumpsuit pants. Right, right. And, and, it was like a superhero was walking down the street. Yeah. Totally. And he was way, way young then. No, he's crazy young. When you see him in those early videos, like, you know, radio and everything, it's just like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, and it's and, you, and, and you know, that's special. No, it's totally special. And, and the crazy thing about it is most people now, you know, the younger people don't even know he rapped. <laughs> no, it's true. And it's sort of sad. And someone was like, oh, what's your old rat? And you feel like if you said Ella Cool J, people would be like, ooh, boring old man. Like, you know, it's like, oh, man, that guy is like off the hook. Mama said knock you out was like unbelievable. Yes. Like, not, not even he, one curse word on that album. It's like still so much harder than yes, doing it. He, he, was, he was the hardest rapper and the best looking. He, he, was, he did all that stuff way before anybody ever did it. Yeah, and he was obviously just like so, like, had a great perception of everything. So he didn't get dragged down by, you know, celebrity. And he had a good sense yeah. of humor. And he sort of, yeah. yeah. And there's some great and, albums. That, and he was real. a great battle rapper. Yeah. No, it was just like the intensity he brought to every every line was totally, yeah, totally satisfying. I still listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Rock the cool. Bells, I Need a Radio, uh, just a whole bit. Yeah. Totally. Absolutely amazing. Tingling Baby. <laughs> there's so many good songs. Yeah, it is. Okay, so, so wait a second. You were in New York when, when all of this was starting. Yeah. No, I think we, um, I was actually, I think we were a couple of years behind, but yeah, it was amazing that we were like, I mean, I remember going down there in 86 and being so excited about seeing stuff and, you know, and like watching a Yo MT rep, you know, back in Providence and then going, going down to Ludlow Street, trying to get your triple fat goose, and like, you know, sort of you know, be a part of that whole scene. So, yeah, you it know, was great. That, Exactly. And, and there was something about the way they showed New York that made you want to be there. Yeah, totally. Uh, by Freddie. And, and yeah, it was just like all these like, because yeah, you feel like they woke all those rappers up. Like, you know, it felt like you, it was like way too early for them when that show was being filmed. <laughs> you know, it's always like, oh, whatever. Yeah. You know, just like, like yeah. yeah, it was great. And, and did you ever go to any of those early concerts? I mean, just like the usual, yeah, Run DMC and, Hell Cool J and Public Enemy, those guys. Like, that was the Public period Enemy. that we were. Wow. Yeah, they were, they were awesome. And they were like, Re saw them Re several Master times. Flash, Melly Mel. Yeah, I never saw them, sadly. That's a, that, that was a little error that I think we were, I was a little behind on. Yes. But, um, but we had um, actually the delivery guy who 
Anthony, who um, he does all deliveries for the, the studio. He would grow up in the South Bronx, and he was a DJ. And I kind of put it together one day. I was like, but you were a DJ in the South Bronx in like the late 80s? That's crazy. And then after he, and he won, then he told me, like, I think I'm going to throw out all my records because I don't ever listen to them anymore. And I was like, are you insane? Like, so he brought all the re, all the records over to the studio. And I still have them. Like, I still got, like, all these, like, extended singles and everybody. You know, Dougie Fresh. All those, like, like, a huge, great collection that just sort of appeared on my doorstep. I'm so thankful. And, and his records. Do you have a record, yeah, record. player? Yeah, no, it's a fun thing about being upstate, too. It's like, it's kind of like, yeah, you do the whole record thing. You, you listen to that one extended remix of whatever, Dr. Bell, and then just flip it over and listen to whatever else. Okay, okay, let, let, me, let me ask you. We have a minute and 30 seconds. Now, All right. the way this works, we can get off and we can get back on to talk more, or you can enjoy your country life. It's, it's your call. Um, what time is it? What's the actual time time? It's 11.50. It's 10.59 right now. Uh, maybe we should call it. What's oh, good, brother. Towards... Listen, man, thank you very much for your time and your expertise. I really, really appreciate that. Hello? It's a great conversation, man. It's a really great talk to you. Mm -hmm. Stay here. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right. We're going to talk to you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Good day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm.